cool kick this thing off. Um, thanks everybody for coming out to the seminar. Um, today we're going to be hearing from two individuals, one professor and one student, and they're going to be talking about professional engineering license and conceptual application for the ID. I'll introduce them one at a time for their respective talks. Um, first, we have someone who most people know, Dr. Culver. Uh, he received his uh, bachelor's, MS, and doctorate from Georgia Tech. Uh, he worked at Oak Ridge from 1991 to 1999. Um, and then he joined um, UC uh, at the end of 1999. He's currently the uh, uh, professor uh, of intellectual engineering and computer science. Um, he's a founding member of Assistant Professor at Drug Theater for Current. Um, Part time senior research engineer with the Power Electronics and Electric Machinery Research Center at Oak Ridge. And um, he's a registered engineer with Tiffany. And he conducts research uh, an application of black white band gap devices um, to the data center power supply, mean voltage utility applications, and electric vehicles. And I will turn it over to him. So maybe he's using a different microphone. So just being brief, I uh, just want to give you an introduction about professional engineer. I think some of you have some idea about what it is. Probably some of you have no idea about what professional engineer is. Um, and so this is the brief outline. I'm going to talk about what some of the jobs, what does a professional engineer do? Why should you consider being a professional engineer? And then how do you go about doing that? So uh, most new construction or major renovations require the design and supervision by a professional engineer. So this building and every building on campus was designed by several professional engineers and architects. Um, and basically the engineer has to stamp the design drawings, stamp the specifications, sign it, certifying that they supervised and or did the design themselves. Uh, and it basically shows that you understand building codes, you understand compliance with rules and regulations, and some minimum level of quality is, is being met. In electrical engineering, uh, to be a professional engineer means you have pretty good working knowledge of the National Electric Code. The National Electrical Code uh, is actually not an IEEE or something like that. It's the National Fire Protection Association, NFPA 70. So it was basically first adopted to prevent fire. Um, and then later it's now kind of used more as a design tool. It's not really a design guideline, but a lot of the design you do is to meet this code. And it covers residential, it covers commercial, uh, it covers things like motors, how large they should be, what wire size, what conduit it should be in, what sort of protections required, it covers lighting, covers cable, cable tray, covers uh, PV, uh, covers smoke detectors, emergency lighting, egress lighting, exit signs, uh, it covers anything from, and it also covers a lot of agricultural things, explosion proof. So this code is revised every three years, and typically all the municipalities across the company adopt it. Um, and so a lot of applying the National Electric Code has to do with doing things like load flow, uh, demand, cable transformer sizing, illumination, uh, then there's the life safety systems that I mentioned. You can see a lot of these systems in the room, like there's emergency lighting over there that'll flash and I'll make announcements. There's exit signs above the doorway there to, to show that's an exit. Notice there's not an exit sign above that door, but that's not an exit. Um, so that's, you know, you say, well, that seems simple enough, but there's certain requirements on the signage and, and the power supplied to it, if the electricity goes out, that sign still has to be lit. So there's battery backup and things like that in it. Motor starting, um, overcurrent protection. So quite a bit that you need to go into. Some of the employers, at least that might 
like for you to be a professional engineer. I'm not going to say require you to be a professional engineer, but would be a benefit. Certainly if you go to work for places that make things like ABB, Eaton, Schneider Electric, those they may want somebody with a PE. But more likely it's some of the power system companies like Internex, EPRI, Mesa Engineering in particular, where they're doing designs. Uh, they may be designing substations, they may be uh, designing power plants, uh, those kind of things. And then the architect engineering firms definitely want you to have a, a professional engineering license. Uh, Bechtel, Enterprise, Aqua Green, they all are trying to find people with, with these licenses. Plant engineering, you don't necessarily need a PE, um, but again, it, it doesn't hurt. Uh, so these large manufacturers like Denso and Alcoa, Exxon, Eastman, International Paper, again, it would probably be beneficial. So why get a PE? They'll pay you more. And so certainly at an architect engineering firm, having that license is a, a very good commodity. I'm not sure how much more they would pay you, but it's probably 10, 20, $30,000 a year or more. And because, as I said, drawings have to be stamped and signed by a PE. So the people who don't have a PE, they can do design, but they have to be supervised by a PE. And he or she has to keep up with, with what they're doing and make sure it's okay. Uh, so in general, you might be more of a supervisor with the PE and you're gonna get paid more and you're gonna generate drawings like what's shown up here. This is a, a one line diagram for a primary school. And, and so you get very familiar with these drawings and this one's a little too fuzzy to tell what's going on, but you can see there's circuit breakers and there's loads in here. Each one of these is likely a panel that's then fed from another panel and, and it shows the protection and whatnot. Um, and wire size and those kinds of things. So you get very comfortable reading drawings because you're the one also generating these drawings. So there are basically four main steps to become a PE. Uh, you need to earn an engineering degree from an ABED accredited program. So if you graduated from University of Tennessee with a bachelor's in engineering, good. Tennessee Tech, good. Um, if you graduated from overseas, it's a little more trouble, but I'm not gonna say it's no good. Uh, just you have to kind of show that your, what you've learned is equivalent to what they do in a degree program here. And, and I think if you earn an advanced degree here, like a master's or PhD, and combine that with an undergrad degree overseas, that, that helps too. Now, if your undergraduate degree is in physics or math, you're out of luck. They want you to have an undergrad degree in engineering to be a professional engineer. So it's really about the undergraduate education you received. It's not about your graduate education. I was a PE long before I was a PhD. Um, second thing, you need to pass the FE exam, Fundamentals of Engineering exam. Uh, Peter's going to talk more about how to prepare for that exam. You also need to then work for four years after you've passed that exam doing engineering design, preferably working with a PE as your supervisor. Um, and they'll allow some credit for a master's degree um, or any co-op experience. And then the fourth step is to pass the principles and practice exam. This yeah, let another exam. And, uh, and so, and it's an eight hour exam and it, it covers something, uh, lots of things. We're not gonna talk about that too much detail. There is a website there, NCEES. They're the ones that administer this exam, put it together and all the states use the FE exam or PE exam put together by NCEES and they can give you more information and, and talk about where to find study guides and things like that. So to be a professional engineer, each state determines whether you can be a professional engineer, architect, landscaper, surveyor, cosmetologist, lawyer, doctor, all of that is certified at a state level. 
And so to be a professional engineer, you do it state by state. Since I'm registered in Tennessee, it means I can do projects that are in Tennessee, but I can't do projects that are in Kentucky or Georgia. I would have to go get licensed in Georgia or Kentucky. So a lot of these large firms, the, their people, they're registered in several states uh, so that they can do projects in different states. It, once you're licensed in a state, it's not too hard to get the other states. You just have to pay fees. Again, there's a web page here that, that talks about uh, the process and, and how to get registered in, in the state of Tennessee. And so once you it's money and application. And so th this slide is talking about reciprocity or comity, meaning once you're licensed in a state, it's whether the other states recognize it. If the other states recognize it, they call that reciprocity. You must pay a fee. If you have actually also have to apply, then they call that comity. And in Tennessee, they don't do reciprocity, they do comity. So they make you apply, they make you get references, certify that, yeah, I haven't been a criminal and I've, I've been good, and uh, people who know me think highly of me, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't have to take more exams. And then, uh, and, and so it's not too hard to get licensed in other states once you're licensed in that first state. Talk just briefly about preparation. Uh, Peter's gonna go into a lot more detail on FE exam. FE exam covers undergraduate material. So when is the best time to take that exam? When you're a senior because you might still remember how to do integrals and differentials and maybe you had a class in fluid dynamics or heat transfer and that sort of thing. So it's a whole lot easier to pass your senior year and your ability to pass is like this as time goes along. <coughs> So if you have any inkling of being a professional engineer, you need to go take that exam now, is what I would say, based on people in this room. Um, the other thing I will say is your ability, there is a high correlation between your GPA and passing the exam. If you had a 4.0 as an undergrad, there's a 99% chance you're gonna pass that exam. If your GPA is 2.2, you probably need to do quite a bit of extra preparation. It's gonna be a lot harder to pass the exam. And so it's one of the few exams that there is kind of a correlation between GPA and uh, how well you might do on this particular exam. Also, if you have a very high GPA, you don't really have to do a lot of preparation. That may be the opposite of what Peter tells you, but if you're a really good student, you've done well all the way through, I would recommend you take a practice exam just so you kind of have an idea of what it looks like and you should be good to go. Professional engineering exam, I'm not gonna give you that same advice. Um, you're taking that after you've been working four or five years. It's probably good to take a short course or you know, do some review. I know I, I took a short course and reviewed for several months uh, before I took that exam. And there's lots of material available to help you with these. So the exam in, in at least the areas everybody in this audience should be interested in are typically offered every April and October in Tennessee. Those dates have been published for the next several years. Uh, what's nice now, at least in electrical and computer engineering, they have several different exams. They have a computer based, they have electrical electronics, and they have power. So you can kind of pick whichever one you think you're strongest in. Uh, this is very different from when I was a student and taking this FE exam, I just took an exam in engineering. It wasn't even electrical. Um, it was, it covered 
chemistry, mechanical, electrical, whatever. Um, so there, and maybe there was a little bit of a section in the area you had interest in. So it, it's changed a lot. You can see all these areas. And then there are some other exams that are offered once a year instead of twice a year. And so you can do control systems. You could do fire protection. You could do software engineering. Uh, all of those are offered just once a year. And then there, you see there are several others. So uh, they've kind of broadened how many of these tests they do. And they've also got a lot more discipline specific. In terms of costs, these are the costs. If you want to take the FE exam, it's $240. The College of Engineering at this university will pay you $200 if you give them proof you took the exam. That means you only pay 40. And, and I encourage you to do that. It's, I'm, the exam used to cost $50. And we had lots of students take it. And then, oh, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 10, they went to this computer test and the price went to 250. Nobody took the test. Because they were like, yeah, $50, I can stomach that, 250. Why do I want to do that? So I, at least I, I will give kudos to at least our college that they are basically paying the students to go take this exam because they think it's important. You don't have to pass it, you have to take it. But of course, if you take it, you need to take it with the intent to pass it, take it seriously. The PE exam costs the same, 240. Of course, that costs that much every time you take it. So if you don't pass it, you're gonna pay that same fee. Once you've passed the exams and you're applying to become a PE, there's an application fee of 30 bucks, and then you have to pay $140 registration fee every two years or $70 a year. Um, and the state of Tennessee, we don't have an income tax, but they find some other ways to tax. So they have what's called a professional privilege tax. So I get taxed for the privilege of being a professional engineer. Um, 400 bucks a year. Again, I, I've heard that they may introduce a bill in the state legislature this year to do away with these taxes. And I hope that happens. Um, the registration fee used to be, I think it was $50 every two years instead of 140. They came up with the professional privilege tax I think it was $100, it went to $200, went to $400. People who didn't practice a whole lot, they just dropped it. And so they had to raise the price on everybody else that maintained it to cover the ones who weren't. So it's, you know, you need to be careful when you make these changes. Uh, if you raise the price, you may have a lot less people participate. I do hope they do away with that tax. Um, and then you need to continue to do continuing education every year. Um, there is a Society for Professional Engineers. Um, I am not a member of, of this society. I believe we have two other professional engineers in the department, Dr. Fran Lee, a professional engineer. He got that when he was working at ABB because it, it was needed, because he was doing lots of design studies. And then Dr. David Iko. Is also a professional engineer. He's more in the fire protection, worked at TVA. Uh, and so I believe Dr. Iko is likely a member of the Tennessee Society of Professional Engineers. And it's just a, an organization to, to get together and talk about some of the things related to that. If I was uh, doing full-time design and, and drawings and whatnot, I would likely be a member of this society. So I'm going to stop here and see what questions you all have. Spencer again. The four years, is it a four year continuing? Yes. Does that have to happen after the FE? I, well, it used to be. 
I don't know if that's still the case. It used to be, and it used to be under the supervision of a PE. I don't, I think they've relaxed that a little bit. It, especially I saw if they're counting co-op and some other things. So it may just be that you're doing some redundancy. Okay. So the answer is yes. Uh, sometimes people do get a PE in more than one category. Also, I am a professional engineer. It doesn't say I'm a professional electrical engineer. But they also say I'm supposed to practice engineering only in the discipline that I know. So if I went off and designed the beams and uh, columns, I'd probably get in trouble, uh, especially if the building fell down on that. But uh, you're supposed to maintain and, and only do it within what you know. So you take an exam in an area, but some people do take exams in one area. Other questions? Go ahead, Jing Jing, and then we'll go to that. I, not unless you were doing a lot of design, um, and, and that's not what we do. We, we do, and when I talk about design, construction design. Um, yeah, it's, uh, no, it, it typically requires the, the, the kind of work you would do working with a company um, as opposed to your, your PhD kind of work. Um, Although sometimes uh, we've had one or two projects here, like we had a solar house and architecture designed it. We did the electrical for it. And, and so I actually had to, I had to stamp some drawings um, and students worked on that. Graduate students worked on that house. And so that would count. I know there's like, like in labs you do like construction related and design like citations. Other than this, like what cap what other benefits do you get um, from this like uh, profession in like or more like personal because that would be difficult to make like over the past like um, years? Well, you know, when I was at, at Oak Ridge National Lab I was working as a engineer and basically doing drawings and stuff. But then when I became more of a researcher, no, it, it was not necessarily, nor as really as a professor until we did that, that house that I was talking about. Um, and I was kind of surprised that, you know, they were requiring us to, to stamp drawings and specifications and, and that was fine. The, uh, I think most of you probably will not have a career where you need to be a PE, but you don't know that right now. You'd be surprised some of the twists and turns in life. And so you don't know what you'll be doing five years from now. So take the FE exam while you can pass it, while you have somebody that's gonna pay you $200. It only costs you 40 bucks now instead of 240. Um, and then worry about whether you're going to be a PE later. Okay, I better let Peter get up here and talk okay. some. Thanks. Uh, over. All right, uh, next, uh, we're just going to hear from Peter Sam. Uh, he's a master's student at Dr. Culver, uh, and he's also doing some research under Dr. Culver. Uh, he received his bachelor's well, degree from the PE. Um, in May, and if you want to start some wireless power transfer and why they have got any conductor application. Just to be funny. Yeah. <clears throat> So I'm not going to use a mic. Um, can you guys in the back hear me? 
Good. Okay. Um, how is everyone doing so far? You like this seminar? It's um, it's kind of different than the typical seminar, right? Now about research topic. Um, so I'm sure nothing gonna go over your head. Okay. Um, I will give you the overview introduction, um, overall introduction and tips on taking the FE exam. Um, now I'm not claiming myself, I'm an expert on the FE exam, but I just, just wanna share you my, uh, what I know about the FE exam and uh, share you some tips based on my own, uh, my, my real experience. So the um, fundamental of engineering, FE for short exam is one of the First um, exam that you need, that you need to take to become the professional licensed engineer. The exam is is um, administered by the National Council of Examiner for Engineering and uh, Surveying, um, NCES for short. After passing the every exam, you are eligible to apply for the engineer intern EI certification. In some states, they may call it engineer in training, EIT certification. Um, as Dr. Tobert tell you, um, you need four years of work experience to um, take the P exam to become a professional engineer. Um, and this exam is designed for anyone who has a bachelor degree in engineering and also for senior engineering students. There are seven different types of FE exam based on your major. So for example, um, uh, mecha mechanical engineering, civil engineering, chemical engineering. So we are all electrical engineering students. So we're gonna take the electrical and computer engineering exam. Yeah, that's right. They can buy electrical and computer engineering into one exam. I wish they could split it, but it is how it is. Um, I don't really like the uh, computer engineering part, but don't worry, the, um, no, the uh, computer engineering questions is only a, a small portion of the whole exam. So you don't have to worry, very worry about it. Um, it's a computer-based exam. There are 110 multiple choice questions. Each question has four possible uh, answer but there's only one correct answer. And um, those multiple choice questions are divided equally into two sections, which means each section has 35 um, questions, if I, if I math is correct. Um, and you, you cannot review or change the answer in a different session. Like, okay, so in the first session you submit it, you cannot go back and change it. So you better review and um, so to answer them all before you submit it. These are the topics that are gonna appear in the exam. Um, basically, you'll be tested what you learn um, during your undergrad. And if you, you look at here, there are only three computer engineering topics, computer network, computer system and uh, software development. So it's not a lot. Also, um, you might have to concern about the engineering economics topic. Um, some of you didn't take this before, so it's gonna be uh, uh, a li li little, little difficult for you. Um, so just keep in mind, uh, you need to review this before the exam as well. At the beginning of the exam, you have a minutes for tutorial on how to use the software. And after that, you, uh, you're gonna complete 55 questions. After you submit the first session, you have an option to take a uh, 25 minutes break. Um, it's an optional, so you don't have to take it. Um, I didn't take it when I was uh, taking the test. It's not like I show off or anything. I just want to get out of there as soon as possible. 
um, and then so you you have so basically you have two hours and twenty minutes to uh, complete a hundred and ten question. The right um, during the exam you have access to an electronics handbook reference on the computer. Um, it has all the equation or concept that you need to know. So you don't have to memorize all the equation. So it will be easier for you. Um, you also be given a professional, um, personal notepad and eraser and marker, um, just like a small whiteboard. Uh, bring the ID with you and passport if you are international students. Sometimes they, uh, they require you to show your passport. Um, and make sure the name on your ID match with uh, the name you register on the, uh, to the uh, website. And bring some snacks, some snack, because this five hour and 22 minutes long, uh, you might be hungry. Um, there's no vending machine in the desk tender. I didn't bring snack. Um, I was so hungry. <laughs> I was doing the exam, right? And then my stomach was like, hey, Peter, I'm poor, I'm bored. Let's, let's demonstrate a thunderstorm style for you. It was so embarrassing. Um, bring a light jacket with you because uh, you know, the air conditioning might be cold. Uh, there are several calculator allowed to um, the desk standard. These are the list of the calculator you can bring to, to the uh, exam room. And the case is not allowed. You cannot bring the case of calculator with you, just the calculator itself. Um, don't bring pencil, scratch paper. As I say, um, you're gonna be given a, a notepad, no smartwatch, no binocular. Don't try to copy other people. There's a camera on top of you, so you <laughs> probably can't do anything. All right, here's the um, example screenshot on your monitor during the exam. On the left side, you have a um, reference handbook. On the right side is the uh, actual exam. On the top left corner is the search bar where you can uh, type in and find um, equation or concept that you need to know quickly. All right. uh, for the passing score, the NCES doesn't announce the required passing score. Um, is constantly changed based on the average score of the examinees um, on that day, on the same day. Uh, but it estimated to be a uh, 50%, so it's not too high. I'm sure you all can pass it. The test result doesn't tell you the, your score, just tell you either you pass or you fail. The fee, I have to um, correct of the program, the fee is only uh, 100. Uh, $75 um, and the school will pay you uh, $150. So basically you have to pay only um, $25 for the exam. All right, you can take the exam all year round as long as um, they have available seat um, for you. Um, before you can check the schedule, you have to uh, register and pay for the exam fee so that you can see the uh, available uh, time. And you have to uh, test it at the Pearson Test Center. The, the closest one in Knoxville is 20 minutes driving away from Mingau. So um, be sure to uh, make sure to be there at least 30 minutes before the exam. So you have time to uh, find a parking lot. It's, it's quite hard to find the uh, real test center. Okay. Um, yeah, like I said, school reimburse you uh, $150. Um, all you have to do is send your receipt to um, Karen. This is her email. Um, she will send you a reimbursement request form. You, you have to fill that out and re resend back to her. Very easy. All right, here's the tips for the exam. Um, like I said, like Dr. Tobert said, yeah, Take the exam while you do still in the school or recently graduate, so you uh, still remember the equation how to do it. Um, don't leave any question blank because score based on your total number of questions you answer correctly. 
there's no deduction on your incorrect answer. Um, so try to answer the more, even though you don't know the answer. You know, you, know, you have 55% of getting correct. Um, let's see. Try to complete the first section in two hours and 40 minutes because the first section stop when you submit submit it. It doesn't stop at you know at half of the time. So if you lose track your time, um, you might don't have enough time for the second session. So try to finish it um, as soon as possible. Um, use the flag tool on the exam window. So when you encounter a difficult question, right, um, you don't try to spend too much time on it. Try to use the flag tool, and then you can go back um, at the end to uh, review and do that questions. So you have more time for easier question. Um, also use the search tool on the windows that I just showed you it's for a quick search on the uh, definition and equation. Um, I think doing the practice exam provided by the NCES is sufficient enough to take the exam. Uh, you don't have to study too hard for it. Um, and bring your passport if you are an international student. All right. So what do you do after passing the exam? Call your mom. Yeah, my mom very supportive. When I call her, she was like, cool. And post on uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, anything. Um, go celebrate, right? But passing the exam doesn't make you um, become a uh, engineer intern. You have to apply for the engineer intern certification. Um, I'm not sure what the fee is. It? Um, I don't know. I haven't applied for it yet. I, I'm about to wait until I, uh, I get a job. Or maybe I should do it soon. Any question? You go over time. Um, okay, so after you complete the uh, 55 questions, right, you have option to go back to review all the uh, 55 questions. And then after that, you will submit that session. Then the clock will stop, they ask you if you want to take a break or not. If you don't, you continue to do the second session. Does it answer your question? No, it's not fixed amount of time. That's why I say try to do that within two hours and 20 minutes or 40 minutes. Yeah, 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. Who plan to, uh, oh, not yet. I will finish it. <laughs> Who plan to, um, to take the exam in this summer? All right, um, so I want to briefly talk about the um, current wiki page. Uh, by, by a show of hand, um, how many of you have ever logged into this website before? Okay, all right. Um, so uh, this web page has been created uh, for a while, I think for a year now, um, but we haven't um, rolled out a official introduction of this web page. Um, so, when I first came here um, as a master's student last semester, uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, you know, adapt to a new environment, um, to learn how to use equipment. So this website was created um, to help new students like me, and also for uh, better sharing knowledge and skill amongst current students. Um, so, all current students can go here and um, post tutorial and learn from, uh, from one another. Um, see. So right now we have around 15 tutorials on this website. It's currently growing. 
Um, we're hoping at the end of this semester, we can have 30 tutorials on this website. It's very helpful, it's a helpful resource. Um, you guys should all check it out and uh, contribute um, to it. Um, also, this one, a student can use their website to look up useful in information like um, the lab layout. And you can keep track the lab equipment on this website as well. Um, and for people who are not from current, they can go here and uh, look up the introduction of um, current, our, our lab center. It's accessible for everyone, not just for uh, current students, for undergrad students as well. So um, if you can go ahead, check out, check out your phone or laptop and then go to that website, I will show you a demonstration. Can you do it now? It's wiki.current.utk.edu. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, right now we have four categories of tutorial: uh, protocol regulation, equipment usage, software, hardware design. Um, but tutorial are not limited to the four categories. Um, you can upload tutorial on any categories. We are gonna create a new one for you. Um, so if you go to let's see, I think this one. Okay, yeah. Scroll down to the bottom. You see my tutorial, and uh, go ahead download it. <coughs> what? Wait, do you have to log in to download it? Sorry, there's some uh, technical issue. I will fix it later. <laughs> but that's it. Thank you.